So I'm so happy you can talk with me today, uh, Jessica Marie Johnson. Um, the students in this course have been reading your paper, um, Markup Bodies, Black Life Studies and Slavery Death Studies at the Digital Crossroads. And we're just starting to learn about digital humanities in this course. And so I found it really interesting to have your perspective as a historian talking about what kinds of things happen when you turn stories and the experiences of people's lives into data. And you describe the data of um, enslaved people and how what happens when that becomes data. Could you say a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, so um, one of my, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. This is a lot of fun. Um, so it's great to talk to whoever is watching. Um, so Mark of Bodies um, is a, a kind of interrogation of the ways that um, Slavery's Archive um, has a particular kind of data and digital humanities is used to thinking about digital data in a particular kind of way. And yet often these are conversations that are happening in separate spheres. Um, so the ways that, you know, um, the slave owners, slave ship captains, colonial administrators, imperial officials, politicians um, created a whole corpus of material uh, in order to better um, control, subjugate, uh, and extract the labor, labor from enslaved people. Uh, and that material like, is its own kind of genre and a lot of ways um, provides a kind of baseline for how we think about data and how we structure our data today. So there's a, um, an amazing book called um, Accounting for the History of Slavery um, that talks about that our management practices, like uh, agendas, spreadsheets, um, uh, registers, like the like you know like things that we're used to seeing, like these boxes that are filled with numbers and names and other kinds of you know biometric information about people, are actually legacies of you know the kinds of material, the literal paper material that had to be created and standardized in order to manage um, this massive economic venture um, for Europeans, which was the subjugation of, of African and people African descent. So what I'm trying to think about in the essay are the ways that the data that we sort of you know, take for granted is defined in X way or Y way, or it's a reproducible figure, or it's neutral, or it's falsifiable. These are terms that digital humanists use um, very easily to kind of think about you know, how to distill some, like complex um, questions or, or events or people in the, in the world that we know is humanist is messy, um, how to distill that into something that can be reproduced by um, a computer or, or in a systemic fashion. And what I am trying to challenge is that that whole impulse to reproduce, to distill, to make things, to, to push things into their most basic unit of analysis um, is actually something that is out of and be, be get from the, the violence of, of enslavement. Um, and I'm also trying to suggest that there's ways that, you know, there's all this material in slavery's archive that isn't seen as foundational history for digital humanists. So people don't think about the spreadsheet as in the legacy of the slave ship register when actually it very much is tied together. Um, or they don't think about, um, we talk a lot about algorithms and, and bio data and, you know, like um, the, what you call it, the Fitbits, <laughs> all these things that are supposed to measure, you know, the, the like our literal like bio rhythms. And we don't think about that as actually, um, and Simone Brown talked about this in Dark Matters, as actually also having a legacy from figuring out the bio data of um, enslaved people so that you could measure that as fiesta on, which was the currency of the slave trade for, um, for years and years. So Marka Bodies is trying to bring slavery's archive into conversation with data, ask digital humanists to think about data in more complicated and, and frankly messy ways that often um, computational people feel very uncomfortable with, and also to, thirdly, to think about the ways that, um, the reason this is important is because there are people um, who, for whom this history is very present. Um, and so in the his, in, as far as the archive of slavery, um, African people of African descent are still feeling the ramifications of the, of the history and the legacies of enslavement and the violences we get therein. And so what are the ways that, you know, both for slavery scholars and digital humanists, we can bring these questions together and do a, a more significant work with them and, and with the communities who, who see these not as like random numbers, but as like hauntings, as memories, and as projects of resistance. 
So it's not just that today's digital humanities databases are sort of forcing these stories into a format that doesn't tell everything. It's that some of this computational structure actually comes from the history of slavery and, and the slave trade. That's kind of shocking. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's um yes I think it's um I think it's it's that and it is shocking and I think it's also it's also both I think there's ways that there's an impulse to database and um create repositories and create archives and um and create sort of stable means of understanding a very complex period that does cause um a digital humanists and and creators of projects sometimes to skip over the messy parts or try and shave off the messy parts of the history or of people's lives in order to fit them into you know these 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 architecture this digital architecture that isn't necessarily meant for the messiness of human lives i mean it's just that that's the whole opposite purpose of a stable unit of analysis um and so one of the things i talk about in the essay are the ways that this has been really really true for the history of slavery that there is a moment in fact um where uh, uh cleometrics which is um sort of a fusion of economic history historians and historians who are interested in, in what, what was at the time sort of like humanities computation but has become um, digital humanities come together um, and try to think about ways that they can mobilize quantification to understand the history of slavery better. Um, one of the impulses though, and it's not across the board because I, I want to emphasize that um, historians of slavery, particularly black historians of slavery, had turned to computation and, and to numbers and data. W.D. E. E. Du Bois has this um, amazing infographics. Carter G. Woodson was always collecting census data and, and quantifying things like the free householders, um, the free owners of slaves in, in different states. So it's not that computation was wrong, but there was an impulse from the cloudmetricians <laughs> um, that was about sort of how to sort of get around the politics of dealing with like a sticky topic like slavery in a moment of like the 70s where you have a lot happening with with black power the the legacies of the civil rights movement etc so there was a kind of impulse to say hey you know we have this method quantification that can really sort of get at the truth of things and we don't have to worry about the politics you know like it will cut through the politics because now these numbers are real and what we found is that you know often the numbers only still only tell one part of the story and so um and so the, the desire to kind of fit these complex, messy, painful, um, and you know, um, often explosive histories into um, into into methods that that seem like they're more stable, you know, or like less emotional, like less political. Um, I think that is actually is a very real impulse, um, and I've seen it in I've seen it for historians who are thinking about slavery topics, um, but I would say it probably extends elsewhere. What I think is special about his slavery's archive is that it's a massive archive. So something like the Slave Wages database, um, you know, that covers, I think now it's up to 30,000 wages, no, 60,000 wages. It was um, created in 1998, um, goes from, it was once upon a CD-ROM, which, you know, you tell your students we did that once upon a time. <laughs> um, now it's available online, slavewages.org. Is, is now 60,000, I believe, voyages, in, uh, discrete voyages. I mean, that's a massive amount of information to ask you know, individual scholars or even teams of scholars to try and analyze. So there's ways that you know, the, the archive that slavery generated um, creates this opportunity and this necessity to, to wield computational methods. But that also needs to be balanced with, okay, how are we I'm thinking about where these methods come from? How are we leveraging them um, and lever leveraging the information against, you know, the kind of broader life stories that we're finding in this archive? And what are the ways that the, that the projects and the research that we're creating remains accountable to the communities that are, see themselves as descendants of the people who are, who appear as like numbers essentially to us. So I think it's, a, it's actually a little bit of, a little bit of both like one you know like we you know i think there's ways to to leverage a kind of empathy and to kind of think about the ways that black studies has offered theoretical frameworks for thinking about black life and the second one of like how to fit you know like how this architecture has come down to us um we can't control for that but we can think about um we can stand less on our on our determination that this is just how data is and try and be more creative about what we do with data, even in the, in the given the architecture that we have. 
You do write a bit about how the transatlantic trade, uh, trade database, um, how they, they did improve, there was a really sort of jarring conflict the first time it was presented in the 90s between the people who were descendants of, of people who'd been enslaved and this sort of very quantifiable thing. And you write a bit about how, how the researchers did improve that relationship over time. Um, could you say a bit, I mean, what should one do as a historian or a digital humanities scholar trying to represent these things in a, in a good way? Yeah, so I actually really like, um, I really like having watched the Voyage of the Slave Voyages database. It's really been fascinating because um, that initial, yes, that initial meeting was um, at, from reports. I was not there. From reports of that meeting, um, I'm thinking in particular of an article by Ira Berlin about time and space and the way that people do think about slavery as memory, not just as history. Um, that it, it, there it was some, I think, surprising conflict because I think that the creators of the database didn't understand or, or expect that it would have the kind of public appeal as immediately as it did. Um, I believe that was supposed to be the kind of a beta showing of the database for, for specialized statisticians and economic historians and it ended up being a much more, a much larger affair um, that eventually, you know, um, disappointed um, the descendants of enslaved people who came to try and find out more of the stories and less of the numbers. And since then, the database has moved from CD-ROM to two iterations of the website, the most recent one um, being particularly robust. Um, it has become um, easier to use for those who are not statisticians, um, uh, much more user friendly. Um, they've incorporated uh, maps, videos, animation, um, uh, as well as adding more voyages and adding another database that, um, if I'm not mistaken, is helmed by George uh, Gregory O'Malley um, on in the inter American slave trade. Uh, they have added uh, summaries where instead of having to like kind of search the database if that's not what you're looking for, um, if you're somebody who's just kind of uh, maybe a teacher or maybe a genealogist and just want a broad picture of what um, the information is doing, they've added images and summaries and things like that. So they've added material that is more pedagogical than it is computational. They've made it easier to use if you want to do if you do want to access the computation um, computational parts, and their rollouts have been much more attuned to a broader community. So the rollout of that first iteration of the CD-ROM to data to, to website, um, it included John Lewis, who you know um, rest in peace now, um, came and spoke at the event. Um, it included. Um, it was a conference, um, I believe, at Emory University that had artists, it had teachers, it had um, panels on curriculum. So, so I've, I've both been really excited about the way that, that the project has responded to people's desire to use it, and also the, 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 the exact ways that they've done it. You know, it's been very clear that they understand that, you know, one of the ways to get community buy-in is to involve community stakeholders. So John Lewis being a community stakeholder, involving teachers and K through 12 um, teachers and professionals, it means that you are involving a whole swath of, of high school and elementary students in the conversation. Um, finding ways to involve community organizations and, and museums, and archives. I think that those are models. I think that those strategies are models for for those who want to in, engage and create projects. So when we're thinking of our projects, um, and there's a project, the Color Convention Project, that does this really fantastically, um, what are the ways that we're not just thinking of creating a repository of something, even if that's our goal, but thinking about, okay, who can we talk to earlier than later about how this, this, this repository might be useful for them? Do we need to talk to black churches in the area? If it's about you know, um, black leadership in, in, in Baltimore or, or Delaware or DC, do we need to talk to community organizations who might wanna use the project? How might we gear, how might we talk to them? How might we talk to them earlier so that we can create you know, um, pages or exhibits or, 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 or aspects of the site that are useful for them? You know, how can we have, um, sessions where we run the beta, uh, the beta version of the project, um, listening sessions or user sessions where we invite them in and then take their feedback seriously. Uh, so there's all, there's all kinds of ways. And I think that what it means is that we don't get to just kind of create a project and then let it live on our computer or on the internet somewhere. Like we have to be in conversation and be collaborative and engage with people from all direction. And it will make a richer um, project. It will make a project that lasts longer and that is more useful to more people than, you know, than maybe our, our classrooms or you know our our media peers in this field. It's really like 
anything digital humanities at the end of the day, nine times out of 10 is basically gonna be public. Like we have to be engaged with the public. So this is a basic kind of research ethics really for digital humanities to think through these kinds of issues. Mm. I think so. I think it's research ethics and I think that it, it, it makes the, the scholarship better. Like it actually makes us ask different questions about the material that we're creating and the theories we're using and the way we visualize those theories in a, in, for the user and, and in, in, a, in, the, in the format that, you know, in, in what format we use. Like it changes everything from whether we use a laptop to whether we make sure we have, um, have our site mobile optimized. I mean, that seems like a small thing, but if what we know is that we want high school students to be able to access it as homework and they're using devices then we have to factor that in and that can be major it can be small sometimes it's small but sometimes that can be a major redesign and so thinking about things like that actually shifts you know what like what does a map look like um, on a smaller device what do we need to do to make sure that that map is either interactive or it can be accessed or viewed even like it just it, it really reshapes how we think about the research itself as well yeah you have a book coming out this month, um, Wicked Flesh, Black Women, Intimacy and Freedom in the Atlantic World. I, I'd love to hear about the book. Could you tell us a bit about it? And, and also, does it use data or stories or how do you deal with that kind of a balance? You know, so um, thank you so much. Yes, so I'm very excited. Wicked Flesh, Black Women, Intimacy freedom, and Freedom in the Atlantic World is um, about to be out. Um, it is available for pre-order at University of Pennsylvania Press. Um, and it is a book about um, African women and women of African descent in the 18th century who are traveling from Senegal, um, who end up you know, around the Caribbean, generally because of the slave trade, of course, and end up in New Orleans. So the way I talk about it is that it's a Black feminist history of the founding of New Orleans. Um, it uh, moves from 1685 to 1810. Um, so it's, it covers the, the range of French, Spanish, and beginnings of the US empire in, along the Gulf Coast. Um, and it is, um, I'm excited about it because it, it does a lot of um, some of this kind of hybrid researching that I think has become really, really important um, in 21st century scholarship. So it's deeply archival. Um, I go to archives on three different continents, um, documents in French, Spanish, and English, um, documents that aren't actually digitized. So I'm actually directing a, um, a digital humanities initiative at Hopkins now called Life Code DH and Enclosure, where we are beginning to kind of delve into some of these like analog documents and think about how to translate them into digital form. Um, but a lot of the material in this era is not digitized. So it is in that way very much a traditional history. Um, but it also gave me an opportunity to think about some of the ways that you know, we can challenge um, missing information, census information. How can we think differently about the kinds of, you know, instructional material that's crossing the Atlantic as trading companies um, give directives to their slave ship captains about what to do about their, their you know, quote unquote cargo, um, all of that. And so one of the, the, um, the formulations I try and think through in that book that I think that I'm going to think through even further in the next project is the null value and how, the, how thinking about null from um, really from a digital humanities sense can actually help us kind of bracket spaces in census data or in the archive more generally um, where you know information is just not available. You know, so what do we do with these kind of empty spaces that still have to be, uh, and think about them as spaces that don't get dismissed as like, well, we can't talk about that. Think about them as spaces that have to be calculated in some way and held, um, and held for what they don't have as much as for, um, as for what they, they are, are not able to offer. So I talked a little bit about that. Um, so it's interesting mix. I'm hoping that, you know, digital humanists, humanists find it um, fun to read. Um, maybe more historical than they would have liked, and I'm hoping that historians find it fun to read, and maybe it's a little bit more data than they would have liked. So <laughs> we'll see if it makes a balance. <laughs> well, that sounds fabulous. I'm looking forward to reading that. Well, thank you very much for your time, Jessica. I really appreciate it, and um, we look forward to discussing your essay more. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>